at 187 AN QAPI, we have access the program of Bachelor in Material Science. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this is the first time we participated in an online assessment. Uh, even though some uh, technical tasks, for example, filming or live streaming and so on, uh, are currently new with us, we finally overcame all the challenges uh, because the AUNQA Secretariat had clearly stated all the requirement explanation and uh, carefully planned the schedule on Zoom meeting. The process were uh, performed uh, smoothly without any significant problems. Uh, we would like to express our best regards and appreciation to the AUNQA uh, Secretariat and uh, Assessors. Hello, last year at the 187th UNQA PA, we have accessed the program of Bachelor in Land Management according to UNQA criteria uh, with the point of five. At this time, due to the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it was first time we participate in an online assessment uh, so some uh, technical difficulty was uh, inevitable. However, under the detailed guidance of AUNQA, um, the direction of the university and our carefully preparation, the process ran smoothly without any problem. Uh, we highly appreciate the professional, efficient and fairly working process of AUNQA assessors, thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Donald Malapas from the University of Santo Tomas College of Rehabilitation Sciences, Department of Physical Therapy. My remote experience with AUN program assessment was really great. Although there was no face-to-face -face interaction, the actual assessment process was systematically done. Even though there were some minor challenges transitioning from face-to-face -to, -face to remote assessment, it was a little bit strange, but we successfully achieved what we have planned. We enjoyed every session, particularly the interviews and the exchange between the students, alumni, stakeholders, and of course, the AU and QA assessors. Come to University of Muhammadiyah Malang, Indonesia. A university with an international touch based on the University Millstone, UMM is in its vision to be internationally recognized. Aunki is one of the steps to achieve the goal. We are committed to providing quality education. I'm challenged to supervise remote site visit of AUNQA in University of Muhammadiyah Malang, the 199th batch. I highly appreciate the full support from AUNQA Secretariat in Bangkok. With the commitment of the K personnel in UMM, we are in our continuous pursuit of international quality. Concerning all parties to be involved during the 119th AUNQA remote site visits in University of Muhammadiyah Malang has always been an exhilarating journey. The key to our success lies within the commitment to be fast response with positive vibes and serving the best we can offer. Above all, regular rehearsals and simulations prior to the actual online site visits are determining our success. As most of the live streaming stations were taken outdoor, we encountered several technical challenges such as outdoor Wi-Fi connection, interfering noise, and shaky video. Dealing with these challenges, some preparations were of urgency. Instead of relying on outdoor Wi-Fi connection, similar data network offers the solution. Training all PICs, operate the camera stabilizers, answers the challenge for the quality live streaming video. Being assigned as the coordinator for interview session, I need to ensure on the following. First, the punctuality of all interviews. 
Second, the availability of quality devices to access online interview, laptop, headset, and internet connection. Lastly, technical meeting to familiarize all interviews with the interview session in collaboration with Zoom meeting at least three times. Inside mastering the basic Zoom function for the remote site visit, ZMD's university level need to perform on these three things. First, ability to speak and comprehend instruction in English. In case of necessary, interpreter is required to be available next to ZMD. Second, maintaining intensive communications among study program team, live streaming teams, the secretariat, and the assessor. And the last, synchronizing the site visit rundown with the key personnel to be spotlighted on the screen. Ensuring stable and smooth internet connection during the events is imperative. Providing the quality devices, video, and so on is another ingredient to conform. As a final point, GMT is to be sure that all participants fully understand the rules during the online set visit. Sharing duties is necessary considering that the remote set visit is carried out in five days back with a number of sessions each day. The ZMT has to make sure every personnel involved in the interview is present at schedule. Renaming and directing the interviewee into the breakout room require operational skills that come from practices. Finally, focus determination on the task at the hand is vital for the best implementation. I'm hired by UMM as a professional interpreter for a UNQA site visit. Being an interpreter for this prestigious event is an arduous yet rewarding experience. Studying the SAR, understanding technical terms, and getting used with the technology were some things I needed to prepare ahead of time. UMM has managed to provide facilities and necessary support that makes the remote interpreting less daunting. Everyone involved in this program has been cooperative and accommodating. These are the keys to the successful assessment. Để chuẩn bị đánh giá chương trình đào tạo cử nhân sư phạm học theo tiêu chuẩn AUNQA thì chúng tôi đã nỗ lực với tất cả những sự cố gắng của mình và càng ý thức được việc tầm quan trọng của việc này thì chúng tôi càng cảm thấy bị áp lực. Tuy nhiên khi được làm việc với hội đồng đánh giá thì không chỉ riêng tôi mà các đồng nghiệp của tôi đều cảm nhận rằng họ làm việc rất chuyên nghiệp, họ đã tạo ra một cái không gian làm việc rất thân thiện, cởi mở và thu hút, làm cho chúng tôi không có cảm giác như mình đang bị đánh giá, mà ngược lại, đó là như là cái cuộc trao đổi chuyên môn giữa các đồng nghiệp để cải thiện và nâng cao chương trình đào tạo. Không chỉ cán bộ của khoa chúng tôi, mà tất cả các đối tượng tham gia phỏng vấn đều chung cảm nhận như vậy. Và đây thực sự là một trải nghiệm rất thú vị đối với tất cả chúng tôi, và chúng tôi cảm ơn hội đồng đánh giá vì điều này. Họ đã để lại cho chúng tôi những ấn tượng rất tốt đẹp. Um, on behalf of the Graduate School of Development Economics, NIDA, I would like to thank the ANUQA team and assessors for conducting the assessment of our Masters in Financial Economics program. Despite being online, the process was rigorous and the assessors were very helpful in providing guidance to improve our program. See you again in five years. science department we are very impressed with the level of professionalism of the secretariat the assessors are very helpful and very insightful and overall it was a great opportunities during the assessment day thank you AUNQA for being partner to create an excellent quality We, Accounting Study Program of Petra Christian University, are very proud to be able to undertake the own QA assessment. Through this assessment program, we can evaluate ourselves on what we have achieved, what areas that can be improved, and what is our position in the midst of global competition. 
Thank you, Heaven QA team, for this valuable experience. Hello, I am Tan Ke Chuan, Chief Quality Officer from the National University of Singapore to the ASEAN University Network Quality Assurance, ANQA Assessor, Trainer and Member of the Technical Team. This presentation introduces the latest Guide to ANQA Assessment at Program Level. We are now into version 4.0. Worldwide, 
there are over 15 university ranking systems in use. Some are more recognized than others. For example, there is the Center for World University Rankings. The CWUR is a consulting organization that provides policy advice, strategic insights, and consulting services to governments and universities. They have the objective of improving educational and research outcomes. There is also the Shanghai-based academic ranking of world universities that started in 2009. Many of us are familiar with the QS World Universities Ranking that specialize in the analysis of many performance parameters in higher educational institutions worldwide. And there is the Times Higher Education World University Rankings that lists the world's best universities. Wherever there is ranking, there is also assessment. Indeed, the two go hand in hand. The Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology, or ABET, is widely used in North America and also worldwide. European countries favour the assessment platforms set by NCAR or the European Association for Quality Assurance in Higher Education. Some assessment systems have worldwide recognition. Others are used within a geographic region. And yet others are country-based, which leads us to the topic of this discussion, the ASEAN University Network Quality Assurance System or Models of Assessment. The AUNQA assessment models are the one and only ASEAN regional model accepted by ASEAN country universities. The AUNQA assessment framework consists of two major components. One is for the assessment of individual academic programs. The other is for the assessment of entire universities. The very first trial program assessment took place at Barapa University, Thailand, in May 2007. Since then, 700 academic programs have been assessed. This is no mean feat, given that AUNQA assessments are strictly voluntary. The first institutional assessment took place in January 2017 at the Vietnam National University, Hanoi University of Science. Let's look at the latest developments of the revised AUNQA model for program assessment. The foundation of an academic program is its expected learning outcomes. ELOs establish what a program's stakeholders want to see that students possess when they graduate. Following the crafting of the ELOs, the program builds its structure and content. What are the first to last year courses? What are the university level required courses? What are the program level required courses? And so on. These are matched to an educational philosophy and a set of teaching and learning approaches and methods to use in training the students. And then how students are assessed must also be matched to the modes of teaching and learning. Together, these criteria 1 through 4 form the design-related criteria of the model. The design criteria are backed up by resources, resources to implement the teaching. These are the academic staff and the support staff also. A university requires also a wide range of support services, course registration, ad drop, financial services, student care services, career services, housing, and so on. These services, which are mostly people-based, are accompanied by enabling hardware, such as physical building, equipment, computer, 
and internet connection and the entire infrastructure of what a university is physically. The design of a program and its ensuing resources applied drive the output and outcomes. These are the number of students graduated, academic publications and other creative works, and also the extent to which employers are satisfied with the program's graduates. Together, the eight criteria drive the achievements of the program. And in the spirit of improvement, this takes place against a backdrop of benchmarking and constantly revising and improving its curriculum, upgrading its staff, and so on. The AUNQA model of program assessment started life with 18 criteria and over 100 requirements. Without going too much into history, suffice to say that the model has progressively become more efficient, there have been less overlap, and more focused on what is important in delivering an outcome-based education. Succeeding versions have also moved away from being more rule-based to being based more on principles. National quality assurance frameworks are mostly, although not wholly, run based on rules, such as the required staff-to-student ratio or the number of publications to produce. Rules are based on numerical indicators that are either satisfied or not satisfied, or complied with or not complied with. As mentioned, the AUNQA model of assessment has succeedingly taken on more of a principles-based approach. Principles refer to broad guidelines, a system of belief, or a chain of reasoning. Principles do not connote the need for numerical targets to achieve. Generally, principles are able to take an organization further than rules can. Compare the set of rule versus principle issues in this slide. Whereas a rule-based approach is generally static and standardized, a principle-based approach is more continuous and is contextualized. Or something that is assessment or evaluation based versus one that is improvement based. A rule-based educational system has a higher tendency to generate fear and suspicion on whether the rules have been followed or whether the numbers provided are accurate. Whereas a principle-based educational system calls for mutual trust and respect among all parties concerned. The program is not told exactly what to do. It is not about the rules. Rather, there is a set of guidelines to follow. In addition to being principle-based, the AUNQA model of assessment does not prescribe any rule or strict requirement. It used to in its previous versions, but not anymore. Areas of improvement are recommended. There are no mandates. There are no must-do. The entire model is contextualized to just academic programs in a university instead of being standardized across industries. The AUNQA competency model starts with the practitioner level. And that includes many of you. You are here to be introduced to the AUNQA assessment model version 4.0. Your aim may be to go for an assessment in the near future. Before the pandemic, it would be the AUNQA tier one training that many of you have attended. At the next level, there is the tier two training. This training teaches one how to be an assessor. And many of you have also stepped up to this training. There are now over 110 well-trained, serving AUNQA assessors. Level three refers to a lead assessor who, in addition to working on an assessment, also has to manage 
one or more junior assessors in the team. This is because assessors minimally work in pairs. Here again, the AUN is most pleased that many staff from many ASEAN country universities have attained lead assessor status. After a number of years of being a lead assessor, the next step is really at the expert level, where an assessor's repertoire of knowledge and skills over many assessments in several faculties, science, social science, medicine, law, engineering, arts, and so on, puts the person at a very advanced and experienced level. That person becomes officially an AUNQA expert. Things have gotten a bit more complicated in the past several years along the lines of there is program assessment and then there is institutional assessment where more knowledge and skills are needed. Remember the earlier slide that showed the institutional assessment model of 25 criteria versus the program assessment model of just eight criteria. There is also a chief assessor level that requires coordination and leadership skills in leading a whole team of assessors, not just assessor pairs. At the trainer level, the skills needed are even more. A trainer trains other assessors to do their job. There is also the design of the training courses. So the AUNQA competency model has really been enlarged and expanded in recent years, especially since 2017, when we got into institutional assessment. Let's briefly introduce the main players of the assessment model, and that is the eight criteria. Under each criterion are a number of requirements that need to be fulfilled. There are a total of 53 requirements, sufficient to fit into just one PowerPoint slide. Again, a far cry from the over 100 requirements of version 1.0. The expected learning outcomes need to focus on what are the eventual outcomes required by the students by the time they graduate. A backward design of the curriculum is used in that it all begins with what skills the employers want the graduates to possess. Backward design means to also first understand what society requires from the graduates. And this is especially so for public universities. What are the skills and knowledge needed for gainful employment? It is certainly not to be further trained for another six months before the newly hired can take on job responsibilities. The objectives, the vision and mission of the program need to be aligned with the objectives of the university. The requirements of the expected learning outcomes are that they need to be specific, not nebulous. They need to be measurable in order that the degree of success can be quantified. Are the ELOs achievable? Or is the bar set too high? Or perhaps too low? Are the learning outcomes relevant to meeting the needs of education in today's world of Education 4.0? And can the learning outcomes be achieved within the time limit prescribed? Within the semester, year, or period of study as defined. All stakeholders, especially alumni and employers, need to be involved in setting the revised expected learning outcome. In fact, one would say their input is crucial. Most likely, an academic program uses a taxonomy to categorize the various expected learning outcomes. For example, if Benjamin Bloom's learning outcome taxonomy is used, there needs to be amounts of remembering, understanding, application, analysis, evaluation, and also the creation of knowledge where a student produces graduation thesis. It is wholly possible to use other learning taxonomies. For example, 
Fink's Taxonomy of Significant Learning discusses how we can be better learners through improving the learning process itself. Or Wiggins and McTeekey's Six Facades of Understanding, which includes a perspective component requiring learners to see an issue from multiple points of view. Biggs and Collins' structure of observed learning outcomes parallel Bloom's hierarchy. The structure is that learners begin with seeing matters as single concepts. This builds into multiple concepts, and then the relationship among the concepts is discerned. And eventually, there may be an abstract level where new concepts emerge. One new requirement for Criterion 1 is the need to show how the learning outcomes have been achieved by the students. Each course begins with students told what they can be expected to learn from taking it. At the end of the course, students provide feedback on a range of issues, including whether the lecturer has done a good job in conducting the course. The assumption is that if the lecturer has done a good job, then the student would mostly be able to achieve the course learning outcomes. For Criterion 2, the program needs to show timely curriculum reviews and input from alumni and employers, as previously mentioned. Nowadays, the dissemination of information about a program is no longer just on a hard copy brochure or on the program's webpage. The first thing applicants ask nowadays is, what is your Facebook page? What is your LinkedIn page? What is your Instagram page? The very important issue of alignment is another key focus of Criterion 2. The learning outcomes from each lesson need to be aligned to the learning outcome of the course. And the learning outcomes from the various courses need to be aligned to the higher level learning outcomes of the program. The learning outcomes of the program need to be aligned with the learning outcomes of the university, and so on. A word on path waste. Used to be that a degree program engages students to study a single, deep, and narrow discipline. Then came the requirement that, in addition, students need to also be well-versed in a broad range of discipline. Thus, the shorter horizontal line, in addition to the long vertical line. Then, some programs went one up by introducing minors. The short vertical line, in addition to the major discipline. Before long, there were double majors, two long vertical lines. Yet other pathways have been devised in more recent years. For example, inter- and cross-disciplinary programs. Such is the response to the needs of employers and industries that continually require ever wider and deeper skill sets from university graduates. Criterion 3 starts with the foundational requirement of having a strong university educational philosophy. To create solid grounding, to be upright citizens, to care for the environment, and to give back to society. The new assessment model will pay close attention to the use of novel or education 4.0 teaching and learning methods. They include online learning, of course, and blended learning, mobile-based learning, the use of AI in learning, gamification, flipped classrooms, and so on. Equally at the forefront, or what will achieve high assessment marks, is the inclusion of skill sets for tomorrow's work. This includes the ability to think laterally, the ability to manage people, to have cognitive flexibility, to be able to negotiate, and to have emotional intelligence. Entrepreneurship has been added as a part requirement in version 4.0.
this new skill set is fast becoming a norm in many universities. In fact, some universities specifically offer degrees in entrepreneurship. Parallel to assessing how novel teaching and learning methods are used is the inclusion also of novel assessment methods. We are all aware of the trend in reducing paper and pencil-based assessment in favour of more real-world and practical-based assessment. Importantly, a programme has to show how well its teaching and learning activities are aligned to achieving its expected learning outcomes. It needs to be shown also that the assessment methods are aligned to what is taught and they must be valid, reliable, flexible and fair. The issue of importance for Criterion 5 academic staff are 1. Looking at the entire higher to retire life cycle, which often lasts for 30 or more years. To see how well planned this is, especially since a very long-term vision is required from planning today to reaping rewards only in 10 years' time. The promotion and tenure process is also scrutinised closely. How long does the promotion process take? One year? Two years? The institution of training or conference attendance for academic staff is also important. What is the budget set aside for training? What measures are in place to encourage research and skills upgrade? On the matter of Criterion 6, Student Support Services, there has not been much changes from version 3 to version 4. However, the emphasis has shifted in line with education being more focused on outcome-based learning. The repertoire of services and activities that move students out of their comfort zone and into wider circles. The need to better sample working life before one graduates. Generally, these are the student services that have taken on greater importance and the emphasis on exposure and understanding the working world takes centre stage. As new jobs are created, jobs that did not exist five years ago, the onus is on the university career services to keep up with changes in the employment landscape. This becomes increasingly important as we move into the world of Industry 4.0. Criterion 7, Facilities and Infrastructure. These are a mainstay of universities. This is probably the criterion easiest to assess and tied directly to funds available. Funds for teaching and research laboratories, for computer upgrade, funds to create that physical, social, psychological and virtual spaces that students desire. These are the spaces that engender relationship building and create lasting memories for all of us as students. What do you remember about your student life? Do you remember the studying part? Or do you remember the part about making friends and having a good time? University life is experiential. It is about making friends that last a lifetime, more so than it is about academics. Criterion 8, Output and Outcomes include traditional measures of performance. These are graduation rate, dropout rate, average time to graduate, stakeholder satisfaction, and others. Expect more emphasis on providing outcome measures as opposed to overt input or output indicators, which are easier to measure. The shift is also towards outcome that take place at the point of graduation and outcome measures taken after students become gainfully employed. Logically, 
the most important outcome is eventual. And this takes place only after several months of employment. Benchmarking and improvement trending will continue to feature positively or to score points in an assessment. Criterion 8 comes full circle, where a program shows the extent to which its expected learning outcomes have been achieved. Criterion 1, the expected learning outcomes, measure achievement of the program ELO. Criterion 8, the results, measure the achievement of the detailed outcomes of the courses and the lessons. There is no change to the AUNQA rating scale. There is no change also to the rating procedure. The assessor pair provide the rating inputs. This goes to the chief assessor, who may or may not moderate them after considering input from all programs in a particular assessment. As said repeatedly, expected learning outcomes are the foundation of an academic program. And equally important is the alignment or constructive alignment among the components of one, what students are expected to learn. Two, what students actually learn. And three, how do we know if students have in fact achieved the learning outcomes? This can be seen at both the micro and the macro levels of alignment. At the micro level in aligning curriculum design, each lesson is aligned to its course, and each course is aligned to the entire program. And there is alignment among the learning outcomes from the program and from the university. These make up the graduation requirements of the student. Alignment in teaching and learning means to use a learning taxonomy such that the various levels or various categories of learning outcomes are included in the program. This is similar for the alignment of assessment methods. To use a simple example, we do not test only for memory learning in examinations. There has to be testing also for application, analysis, and knowledge creation, and so on. At the macro or high level, we see alignment among one, what is taught, two, how it is taught, and three, how it is assessed. And these need to be aligned to the eventual outcome, which are the needs of the employers and more broadly, the needs of society. Because what goes around comes around, there needs to be a feedback loop with employers and society providing input that continually adjusts the ELOs and the teaching and assessment methods. This feedback loop is new for version 4.0. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, a synopsis of version 4 of the Guide to AUNQA Assessment at Program Level. If I may make two final points. First, the model, as the diagram shows, it looks formal. It looks serious, a no-nonsense model to be applied exactly. If you wish, consider this stylized, less formal, less serious, or casual representation of the same model. And finally, a pitch on one other AUNQA activity. The AUNQA has in its works an even more exciting development of revising its institutional assessment model. This effort will be larger. Remember, 25 criteria for institutional assessment compared to eight criteria for program assessment. Revision of the institutional assessment model won't be completed anytime soon, but look out for information about it as we continue on our shared transformation journey. Thank you for your attention.
morning, Krika is That's a very, very good presentation. Very impressed. Thank you, thank you. It had to be um, professionally recorded in the studio, as you can see. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I, I believe that the, the star writer, when they uh, they watch that, uh, yes. they, they can do a better job, right? Yes. yes. You work very hard, Professor Tang. <laughs> yeah. And uh, PDF version of the PowerPoint slides and the video. Before, before this is over, Bunny will post it on YouTube and on Google Link. Mm -hmm. So people can watch it again, again, and again. A lot of questions. <laughs> so that's good. That's good. That that people interested in that. Mm. We have translated into Vietnamese already, so we send around in Vietnam. So I believe that you would uh, get a lot of questions from Vietnam. Wow. Okay. Morning, everyone. I can Morning. Morning. I think with so many questions, we don't have time to ask you. <laughs> Actually, I have a question. Please ask. We have 10 minutes. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, Casey, since we are stick to the learning outcomes, yep. um, I wonder where is innovation in this in this model? Okay. Because when you stick to learning outcomes, you are going to ensure that it is achieved, right? And when this uh, industrial 4.0 and this education 4.0, one of the keywords is innovation. How can we assess this? Or we don't have to? Yep. Thank you, Casey. Please enlighten okay. me. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, since we're all here, I tell everyone this first, okay? The video that you just saw is only 10% of what will be shown. It's only 10% because we realize it's only an introduction model. Introduction, you cannot say a lot of things. You know, it's just to introduce to people who are new to the model. It is only 10%. There are a total of 10, 10 modules. This is only one module. There are eight criteria. Each criteria will have its own module. And then there's another introduction module, total of 10 modules. Before this launch is over, Bunny will send a link or more than one link to everyone. All 10 modules will be made available to everyone. Every criteria will be explained in full. Criterion one will be explained in 30 minutes. Criterion one alone is 30 minutes. I will go into detail on every criterion. If you download everything, it is more than 10 gigabytes. All the details are there why we have entrepreneurship, why we have criterion requirement 1.5 and so on. So um, to me, that is really the bigger thing. The introduction that you saw just now is only one small part. So that's more important for everyone. I mean, we know everyone wants to know all the details. There are details about the model, and then there are details of all the administrative matters. I guess the AUN will answer all the questions about the administrative matters. And don't forget, this is also there, right? This book, is all the details are there also, including the new appendices, the new desktop assessment, and so on. So... Um, it will take some time la, for everyone to look through all the material. Um, but we'll be there and hopefully that will answer a lot of questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Casey. Mm. Okay, um, so hi, good morning. So um, this is the Q&A session now, um, it's starting. So, um, 
we have a few questions already lined up um, from the floor as well as um, from um, the panelists as well. I know that some of you have questions already. Um, can I start the question with um, Dr. Bodhi, please? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, in the manual 4.0, I read that the, the criteria are grouped into three program resources and result. Uh, however, in the sub criteria 1.5, a program to show the expected learning outcome are achieved by the student by the time of graduate is grouped into the program instead of the results. I just wonder uh, the, the, the con your consideration why you group it into the, the program instead of the, the result. Uh, the second okay. question. Uh, the second question is uh, still in the sub criteria 1.5. Uh, we have to measure the assessment of loads of PLOs upon uh, student graduation. Uh, however, to the best of my knowledge, uh, there are a variety of methods uh, or approaches to measure the achievement of uh, loads, and no such standardized method or approaches to measure the achievement of loads, ranging from very simple one, for example, by just by measuring the grade or GPA uh, to a very complex one, measuring the achievement of individual ELO from the grade, uh, sorry, sorry, from a particular process. Uh, at the same time, you also mentioned that the, the PLO could be measured by indirectly, for example, by survey from stakeholder or user about the performance of the alumni. Uh, how do you deal with this matter? I mean, uh, as, as uh, uh, sorry, program or university, uh, it, is, uh, it is, what do you suggest? I mean, uh, what do you recommend to this situation, to this issue? Thank you. Okay. Hello, Budi. Thank you very much for your question. To answer your first question, uh, requirement 1.5. That is a smart question because requirement 1.5 is new. Requirement 1.5 is the most important for the ELO. Requirement 1.5, measure achievement of ELO. Re criteria number eight measures the requirement below the ELO. Below the ELO is your exam, test, homework, project, and everything. So requirement 1.5 and criteria eight try to close the loop among the whole model. You start by 1.5, measure only achievement of the broad ELO. That is requirement one by five. Then re the requirements in criterion eight measure all the details, all the details of student achievement, research project and everything. The 1.5 broad criterion eight, the detail, that is how we close the loop. And again, um, you have to go into the details in the guide and in the videos to see the details, okay? That's your answer to the first question. Second question, um, yes, there are quantitative answers on what you achieve, how many percent and so on. And then there are also survey feedback from exit surveys, uh, from end of semester when you survey the student, how they feel whether or not the ELOs have been achieved and so on. Um, we purposely built into it a number of different type of indicators for the teaching, the workload and everything. Okay, um, that is what we do so as to get a better holistic idea of the full achievement of the program. I hope that answers your question, Budi. Thank, Thank you, Cassie. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Budi and Dr. Tan for the answers. Um, so the next question we have um, from the, um, the Zoom function, that would be, um, so to improve our curriculum development, what are the differences between AUN 1.5 and AUN 8.4? Also, please kindly explain how the requirement 1.5, table 2.1 in the manual will be um, assessed. Okay, hold on. I got <laughs> the question is also in the um, Q&A that we share the screen as well. Okay, this question is 
related and similar to Buddhist question, 1.5. The program to show that the ELO has been achieved by the students by the time they graduate. And table 2.1, only the ELOs, okay? That is requirement 1.5. Now we go to requirement 8.4. You go to requirement 8.4, you see it is more detailed. The requirement for achieving ELO for your homeworks, for your exam, for your tests, projects, and so on. So again, uh, I'm giving the same answer here as I gave earlier to Budi. Requirement 8.4 is more detailed, whereas requirement 1.4 is at a more global level of only the ELOs. And again, requirement 8.4 is for all, you remember, you got to show it for every course, every course in the program. Whereas requirement 1.5 is only for the ELO or the entire program. But 8.4 is for all the courses, much, much more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sims. And now we have like next questions from the floor as well. So um, this one, they're asking are the templates for individuals, questions that we should ask stakeholders? Okay. There are templates for the desktop assessment, for the detailed report and so on. Template meaning it is a table, what column, what you fill in. There are templates also, example questions that we ask. Uh, if anyone remember the tier one training, uh, we gave out a series of, these are the kinds of questions you would ask students. These are the kinds of questions you would ask alumni. These are the kinds of questions you would ask employers. So yes, there are, but they are not in this menu right now. We will have to find a way to get these questions to you, okay? So answer is straight, short answer is yes, there are such standard questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tan. So um, the next question, um, we would like to help you answer as this is um, directed to the Secretariat. So um, has the timeline been uh, um, altered as a result of um, assessment going online? So the answer to that question would be um, the version 4.0 of the guide will be in parallel implementation starting October to 2021 until September 2022. During this time, the university may choose any version for their assessment. Starting October 20, um, 2022, the version 4.0 will be in full implementation. Thank you. And um, now back to you, Dr. Tan. The next question would okay. be, um, is it possible for you to provide the information on which stakeholders should be approached to answer particular questions? Again, is it possible to provide information on which stakeholders should be approached to answer particular questions. Okay, the answer to the question is the same as the previous question, meaning there are this list of answers to ask employers, there are this list of questions to ask students, staff, support staff, alumni and employers. So answer is yes, there are. We will have to show from the... Uh, this is information given out in the previous year one training. Okay, so it says yes. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tan. Take yeah. note, we will forward this list of questions. Yes. Okay, thank you. And we have next um, following question. So what means of study should be introduced after the pandemics? And did you incorporate aspect of the COVID-19 pandemics um, into the, um, uh, the version 4.0? Okay, I can only answer part of the question being yeah. what means of teaching and learning to use during and after the pandemic. I guess in a way, it is the right timing because the move is towards blended learning, flip learning, more use of IT and so on. And now that we are in the pandemic, we've got no choice but to enter into it. So to answer the question, there will, be an, there will be an accelerated introduction into the use of IT for teaching and learning, okay? Mm -hmm. um, that is online. 
So yes, it is basically that direction, flipped, blended, uh, video lectures, and so on. That's how mm -hmm. it will be, as okay. we are already doing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tan. And um, we have like um, questions. Uh, then this one, um, I think um, the secretariat can answer this question. So um, they are asking the university is currently preparing to submit um, the program for um, assessment as part of our, and as part of our preparations, um, we are planning to conduct a one day or half day orientations on the um, QA version for manuals and the best practice of OB in the ASEAN. So the question was, is it possible for us to invite someone from your team and what will be the process and how much we will be paying for the resource speakers um, and with the target date for the orientations in August or September of 2021. So um, allow me to answer this question. So um, the AUN Secretariat, um, we will be rolling out the training workshop uh, for the AUN QA assessor first. And at the same time, we are preparing a training module, which um, is introduction um, to content of this version 4.0. And some of the training modules and also already been made available uh, on our YouTube channels and the link to the channels will be shared with you in the chat box. So um, yeah, I hope that um, this answer your questions. And back to you, Dr. Tens, we have um, uh, next questions related to online education again. So the questions was how to ensure the qualities of online education. Wow. Oh, sure. Um, it's not <laughs> I have quality learning. Um, feedback again, feedback from students, having data on mm -hmm. all the resources that the university has to provide the online learning, whether it's uh, videos, PowerPoint slides, and so on. Okay. Um, it goes back to the criterion on QA, how to ensure that your system is sufficient, getting the feedback, measuring your performance and so on. Okay, that is the broad answer that I can give. Amy, I would like to come back to the answer that you just gave. Since sure. 1,000 attendees are here now, let me mention mm -hmm. it. The 30, minute that you, the 30 minute video that you just saw is only the 10% tip of the iceberg. 10% only, it is only one module. If any university wishes to do a one day course, there are a total of 10 modules. Each module about 20, 25 to 30 minutes, some a bit shorter. In fact, if you download all 10 modules, there will be more than 10 gigabyte. All the modules will be available, uploaded to a Google site or whatever site by the end of this introduction. You can take all these 10 modules and use it for your one day introduction, short course, or whatever. Um, I would like to show you, let me use share screen, a teaser video, a teaser video of what these modules are. I will do the share screen now, please. Welcome back. This is module two, criterion one expected learning outcomes. The way the slides are organized in this extended introduction is that each criterion and its requirements are shown at the start. In the case of criterion one, there are five requirements. Requirement 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1.4, and 1.5. A popular hierarchy for categorizing learning outcomes is that of Benjamin Bloom's Learning Outcome Taxonomy. There is also the six facades of understanding developed by Wiggins and McTeeke in 2005. There is also the SOLO or the Structure of Observed Learning Outcomes Taxonomy. So, here are the key concepts in providing an outcomes-based education. For Criterion 1, Requirement 1.1, the program is to show that its expected learning outcomes are appropriately formulated according to a learning taxonomy. There is an entire range of ELOs, from those that are individual lessons or lectures, to those that are courses, to those from an entire program, 
from the faculty and from the university. As you can see, the teaser video goes into the detail of each criterion. Okay, you can find all the details there. Again, a total of 10 modules. Uh, the module video will be there. The PDF version of the PowerPoint slides are there for all 10 modules, including the launch video that you just saw. Okay, there will be some homeworks and some exercises also. That's the best we can do. We cannot give you a tier one training. So all these modules will be there for you to use as much as possible. Thank you. Thank Question you very much. Question from Casey. Okay. Yes. Casey, Casey raised his hand. Oh, oh, oh okay. Good, good morning. I would like to uh, give praise to AUNQA for this successful innovation and improvement. It's going to have a powerful, positive impact. Uh, two things that I can note that will have a po powerful, positive impact. Number one is integrating quality enhancement into the other criterion. And secondly, the reduction in the criterion, the number of criterion and requirements, because when there are too many criterion and requirements, what can happen is that they can obscure the more relevant criterion. I do notice that benchmarking is still a key part of criterion eight. And I also notice in my experience that benchmarking tends to be one of the weaknesses of universities. I would like to ask if AUNQA has considered uh, training on benchmarking or acting as a facilitator of benchmarking among AUNQA members. Thank you. Who would like to answer this question? Dr. Chultes? Um, uh, on my yeah, part, this I, is what I say now, okay? This is what, uh, thank you, Casey Barnett, for the question. This is what the AUN is able to offer at this time, these 10 modules. Can we go one step further? I guess, I guess, I, I can't do it alone. Individual assessors cannot do it alone. It's got to be a group effort. Perhaps we can move this up into a one day event. Looking at the modules, doing exercises, doing some of the homeworks, I guess that would be the next logical step. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. But a number of different assessors would need to get together to make it happen. Okay. But yes, I guess that would be the next logical step. Thanks, Casey. Thanks, Casey. Thank much, that Dr. can be done. It's uh, in our ammunition of what we are going to do next. Thank you, Casey. Thank you. Um, um, next question we have from um, the studio guests as well. So, um, Dr. Clarita, please. Good morning, Dr. TKC. First, congratulations to you and to the rest of the team for the revised guide. I think we all agree that um, this version 4.0 integrates more cohesively the PDCA approach under each of the eight major criteria. So since we already heard earlier that modules will be released to explain in more detail each of the criteria, I guess I will just proceed with a very practical question. Um, you mentioned earlier there are around 110 assessors who are also um, attending this launch. And what major reminders would you like to give the 110 assessors who will have to transition now from version 3.0 to 4.0 um, in conducting the program assessments from here on? Thank you very much, Larita, for your question. Thank you. I guess um, the answer would be everyone, definitely including all the assessors, would need to go look at all 10 modules, okay? Go to all the videos, 20-minute, uh, 30-minute 30 minute, 30 minute video and so on. They will be informative. Go to the video and of course, you got to study this uh, new uh, blue color book thing, okay? Uh, everyone need to do that. And to even move forward a bit more, I think everyone is already doing that. In fact, some programs have already even before the launch today, 
They have looked at the manual and they are already preparing on their own to have a version 4.0 assessment. Right, Kalirita? I'm sure mm -hmm. some people are already doing that, okay? Some people are moving ahead, jumping the gun to do that already. So, and again, you know, I don't know. Are we early? Are we late given this pandemic? I guess in a sense we are late, okay? But we're doing it now, okay? Using it now so that everyone can use it now. Thank you, Clarita. Thank you. Thank you for the answer, um, Dr. Tan. Um, next up, we have um, also from the studio guest as well, um, Dr. Teresa Perez, please. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Casey, for the wonderful presentation. It's really very clear to us that uh, the backward design from the outcomes and then going to the outline and then the teaching learning activities and assessment constructive alignment we know is very important and uh, to be able to achieve the objectives of the or the outcomes for our students now uh, i know also you mentioned that uh, we will have a copy of the the 4.0 manual and the details we will have them so uh, my question actually is uh, on the possibility that AU and QA would, do, would give some training or seminar regarding instructional design because many of our deans and the faculty members in the different programs that we have are not really education major and doing that uh, constructive alignment from objectives up to assessment to be able to achieve the outcome is really very, very difficult. Of course, we try our best really uh, doing it for each of our courses in the program. But then again, training would be uh, good for our uh, faculty members and, uh, and the deans also. Just want to find out. Thank you. Uh, perhaps the AUN should try and answer that question. Uh, yes. On training. Uh Thank you very much for for the the question. It uh, it in itself uh, re reflected a very very important thing that in the drawing board of the AUN Secretariat right now, which is we would like the the upcoming uh, training exercise uh, incorporate both the the heart the heart and soul and the body of what we are doing. Um, meaning that the main objective, the, the body, the body, I mean, the body or the main objective of the training, of course, is to prepare the study program to be able, number one, to, to familiarize themselves with the AUNQA system. And objective number two is to prepare themselves to do the assessment or receive the, the assessment by the AUNQA. That is, that part is what I call the body, the body. But from now on, the secretariat is of the opinion that the body needs the soul as well. The soul which is at the heart of what, what you mentioned in the question, at the heart of the education, is the culture of what, what you are talking about, the culture of outcome-based education, the culture of serving the world of work, the culture of taking care of your graduates, of course, to be in the, in the world of work. This is the, the, the heart and soul, what I'm talking about. So in the drawing board right now, we are designing the, the next, wave of training by the AUNQA and it will incorporate both heart and soul and the body of AUNQA and the detail will come out soon thank you thank you very much thank you very much Dr. Teresa um coming back from um questions from the floor um there are questions asking about um can you explain more about the criteria 2.6, Dr. Casey? And um, what should we do if we don't have the minor specialization? Criteria 2.6. Okay, criteria 2.6, the curriculum to have options for students to pursue major and or minor specializations. 
um, this requirement was also in version 3.0. It's basically for students to have more than one fixed pathway. Choose that, that students can choose to, hey, I want something better. I want something more. I want to do a minor. I want to do a double major, as I've mentioned in the presentation. But today it's even more than that. It's even more than that because some degrees, some universities in ASEAN countries have started multidisciplinary program. You are an econs major, you can go take something in engineering, you can go take something in science. That is the direction in which the world is moving. The boundaries become the important area now, the boundaries, not the discipline them, themselves. So crossing these boundaries to be interdisciplinary, that's how education is moving. Talk about education 4.0, that is how it is moving, okay? So thus the need for the curriculum to have options for students to pursue other majors or to have one or more minor specialization. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tan. Um, next question also from the studio guest, um, Dr. Helmi Yusuf, please. Uh, thank you uh, very uh, Good morning, uh, uh, congratulations to AMK for the uh, New manual guidelines, and then uh, I just uh, see this as a positive uh, in helping higher education institutions to evaluate the programs. Uh, in terms of the increasing number of criteria from more than 100 to 8 criteria, then uh, you see that uh, more than half of the requirements have been reduced so far uh, from the, the, the from the, the latest persons of the 4.0, then uh, what do you think uh, when we talk about effectiveness of uh, uh, assessment uh, in uh, making assessment on a study program's performance, uh, if you see 53 uh, requirements, uh, do you think that there are possibilities that is there any chance that it felt it still can be uh, made uh, more condensed or uh, uh, reduced in terms of number? Tell something about this. Okay, let me try and answer the question this way, okay? Don't look at the requirements as being linear. One plus one is not two. Some requirement is bigger than others, okay? Yeah. We have gone down from 67 requirements in version three to 53, is it 53 requirements in version four. We have reduced the number of requirements, but don't forget, we added some new requirements also. So there is two points there. Some were added and there were quite a few taken away from version three. Don't look at them in terms of linear being, oh, 60 requirements versus 50 requirements, no. As said in the talk that we try to make it more efficient now. Yes, we reduce the number of main criteria from 11 to eight, okay? So everything seems more um, focused only on the program and less on the university. I would say that is one big part of the answer because it is oftentimes difficult to separate university requirements from program requirements. But that is what we try to do, focus only on program requirements. And of course, we are doing that revision also of the institutional assessment to how to make it more efficient also, to basically make it more efficient. And again, you have to look to the individual module videos to see where we cut down certain areas that are, how to say, I guess the only way to put it is certain areas that are less important, we remove them from version 4.0, okay? More focused, more efficient. That's the answer. Right. Thank, you, Helmi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Yusuf and Dr. Tan. Um, next up as well, um, from um, studio guests as well, from Dr. Mo Wan Chuan, please. Good morning, thank you. Morning, Tren. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tan Kai Chuan and IUN Secretariat for preparing this wonderful launching event. 
Uh, my question, I have two questions. So uh, could Dr. Tang Casey explain briefly why there is no checklist in the new manual, but just the requirement to fulfill? And uh, number two. Three, what was that checklist? Yeah, so no checklist anymore compared to the version three, we have a checklist. So in version, in version three, we have a requirements and then we have a checklist. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Yeah. The checklist is still there. It is all still there, except that in the presentation, in the PowerPoint slide, I move away the checklist. So I simply got more space to show the requirements. The checklist is still there in the guide. In the my, my number two question would be, suppose that the uh, QA system at the program level at the moment satisfies the requirement of version three. So what major changes to the current QA system should be made to accommodate the requirement of the new version? Thank you. Um, okay, to answer that question, uh, I don't know if you can see this, you have to go to the book. Actually, they cannot see. Um, I tell you what, hold off on the question. Let me try and show it, okay? Move to the next question first. Move to the next question. Okay, um, if you'd like me to move, then um, we have another question as well. Um, actually, while Dr. Tan is um, prepping for the answer, we actually have some um, questions that a secretary could actually answer. So um, if I got a question from the floor as well asking um, if they could get the presentation material and a copy of the version 4.0 manual. So that um, answer is the video recording of this launch will be emailed to you after this event has ended. The, the event video and the training module will be shared with you um, via the link to download and also watch on YouTube. Um, we have a playlist created already. The link will be shared with you um, shortly. And um, it will be provided to um, with you in the chat and also will you know, later be emailed through the um, your email that you registered. But the soft copy of the version 4.0 is available for download in the Google Drive now. You will get the link at the end of this event as well. Um, then another question would be, um, could you let us know that the contact person for us to communicate for further action? So um, we have mainly two communication channels, which is um, you can reach us at the AUNQA secretariat at the AUNQA.sec at gmail.com, so auqa.sec at gmail.com, or you can uh, message us on Facebook at, um, you can search the AUN-QA and that should come up as our Facebook page. So um, are we good, Dr. Tan? Okay, well, one moment, to answer Dr. Twain's question, go to the guide, page 15, the relationship among the eight criteria of version 4.0. You will see that what has been taken away, what has been added in this version 4.0 model, page 15 of the, of the, of the version 4.0 guide. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Kachi Pond. Dr. Kachi Pond, please. Morning, Casey, and I'd like to congratulate the AUN Secretary for the version four. And so I have a questions on the criteria uh, three, which is about the uh, teaching and learning. Uh, yes. I see that uh, there is uh, the new things add to the, the criteria, which is uh, we want to teach the uh, student and let the student learning on the innovation, creation, and entrepreneurial mindset. And so if you would like to guide us uh, how the reflection of the, this teaching and learning to the result because uh, I considered the result on the criteria eight, which is a uh, reflect on the, the, the research of the, the teacher and the, the students would be only one criteria, but uh, the, the old version, it's reflect on the both teacher and the students on the two criteria on uh, criteria 10 and 11. So, which is uh, mean that uh, if we stimulate the student to do innovation, but uh, with the result, um, it might, you know, uh, show more 
um, idea of the student and how do we asset and how do we prepare the you know um, the form of the the program to let the student have uh, innovation. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kagibon. I try to answer your question in this way, okay? A summarized answer. A few changes to criterion three. One, we added entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship not in version three, okay? It is in version four, one. Yeah. We added new skill sets for 2020. Your new skill sets, I mentioned cognitive flexibility, emotional intelligence, and so on. These are the new skill sets for lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we added that also and um, entrepreneurial, new skill set, and also, um, no, so those are the only two new things. What remains important is the, what the alumni and employers say is important. How to get their feedback to put into the new curriculum, to put into the new teaching methods, that PDCA get their feedback and put back in. That is for criterion three. For criterion eight, criterion eight, you see, is a quantitative criterion. We still measure whatever the program wishes to report. You want to report that we teach this new skill, this is what new students learn. Um, like for uh, one example, we are seeing that more and more students, do, they don't just go get a job become entrepreneur, they have their own, they create a job. Okay, that would be one new thing to look at. But basically, criterion eight remains the same. Whatever the program wishes to report or wishes to report of what their results are. So I answer that question, I, I, I hope that's do, useful. Do, do you think it is going to like, you know, the startup things or it's just an entrepreneurial mindset? Okay, to answer in a short way, we are seeing more and more of that. That's why we added this requirement. Mm -hmm. More and more entrepreneurship, enterprise, startups. Mm -hmm. So okay. that is why it is new in version 4.0. Okay, all right. So universities okay. are doing that, more programs are doing that. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Dr. Khaji Pon and Dr. Tan for answering the questions. Um, so we now um, on to our last question. Um, from Dr. Din Tan, yet please. Thank you, uh, Penny. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Tan Kesi, for your very interesting presentations. Now, I have some questions uh, regarding to some criteria. The first one, criterion 1.5. Uh, could you explain in slide number 18 and slide 26 uh, how does the university evaluate percentage? 25 percent, 50, 75, 100 percent of achieving program learning outcomes uh, by the criterion 1.5. Why exactly 25, 50, 75, 100 percent are is just is simple. By the way, would you explain the table in slide 26 and percentage of uh, learning outcome achievement by different type of segment in slide 26? So that's my first question. Dr. Tan, you muted. Okay, the next question are you will answer. You, yeah, let me answer this question first, one question at a time, okay? I don't have the slide in front of me. Yeah, okay, okay, thank I'll you. Answer. Everyone is very smart. 1.5 is a new requirement. So everyone focus on it. Everyone knows that this is a new requirement. You measure achievement of this by you ask the student, when the student finish taking a course, you ask them, after having taken the course, how do you feel whether the ELO of the courses have been achieved? You get their subjective opinion, you look at their exam grade, you look at their homework grade, you look at all their grading, and then in the end they will say, oh, at the start of the course, the lecturer gave me these eight expected learning outcomes that I will learn if I take this course. Now, Mm, I think four of them I've learned 50%, two of them I've learned 100% and so on. So you basically get this feedback from the students in measuring the achievement of the learning outcome for requirement 1.5. Okay, that is the answer. Now, next question, please, Dr. Tan. 
Thank you. Um, and also for this criterion, suppose that we just begin to implement management of program learning outcome this year, 2021. And after two years in 2023, for example, we will have an IUNQA program assessment. So we will not be able to evaluate on program learning outcomes because uh, the duration of learning is four years. So can we show results of assessment just for a few from the learning outcome at that moment for assessment? The answer would be yes, because it happens all the time. In all the assessments that the AUNQA has been doing, many programs are transiting between an old curriculum and a new curriculum. Many programs transit between old ELO and new ELO. We will see some, some results of the new LO, we will see other results of the old ELO. So the answer is basically yes, okay? There will be transition, but we can still do our assessment anyway. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So the next question uh, concerning oh, lesson learning outcome. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's like 1930, you mentioned that all lessons in the course fulfill the course learning outcome. Yes. Would you clarify the role of lesson learning outcome in assessments? Does the university need to monitor the lesson learning outcomes or just monitor until cost learning outcome level since they are a lot of lesson learning outcomes. So my suggest to give the rights and academic freedom to the lecturers to ensure the learning out lesson, lesson learning outcome by themselves. And the university just uh, monitor the, the um, level of cost learning outcomes until program learning outcome or university learning outcomes. Okay, I would say that for the assessment, we have no time to look at lesson learning outcome, but we have to look at course learning outcome. For one degree program, there are usually about 40 courses. That is already a lot. So we look at course learning outcome. We look at program learning outcome. We look at the learning outcome required by the faculty, required by the university. Okay, so the lowest that we will go to is the course learning outcome, but we would also like to see all the course syllable, course preparation detail, some of the lecture notes of individual lectures and so on. We want to see them, but we do not evaluate lesson learning outcome. We only go to the level of course learning outcome. Okay. Okay, thank you. And the uh, assessment time, that's just uh, example in slide 26, it's just it's simple, right? There's been no change. So I guess, yes, it remains the same. There's been no change. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kirsi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So um, I think um, we come to an end of the Q&A session, um, don't, uh, Dr. Tan and um, our studio guests. So um, actually, um, we still have a lot of you know, pending questions from um, Zoom chat, Facebook, and also YouTube. Uh, but um, because um, the session is coming to an end, so please um, note that we will be responding to all of your questions um, through our um, e-newsletters. So please do not forget to subscribe um, for our e-newsletters and um, through um, by emailing us at aun.secretariat at gmail.com. So aun.secretariat at gmail.com. So you can keep um, you know, uh, updates um, with the um, answer to all these um, questions that we received today. So, um, so coming up next, um, we have some surprise for you before we end today. Um, but before that, um, Dr. Tan, do you have any, um, you know, um, words to say before we move on? Thank you, Amy. Go and look at all 10 videos, okay? That will answer a lot of your questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dan. So um, without further ado, so yeah, let's see the surprise we got for you. So that was the end of the um, today's um, launch.
So thank you very much everyone for attending. Thank you so much Dr. Tan for um, the videos and answering all the questions that um, everyone has. So don't forget that you can subscribe to our newsletter for um, all the um, questions that will be answered um, as well. And um, you can always see in the chat that um, we have already put in the link for the um, YouTube playlist as well. And under the YouTube link, you will find the Google Drive where you can download all the materials as well that's related to um, the video. So yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you.